And I'd like to thank the Coolidge Corner Theater and the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation for supporting the Science on Screen series. And now, Professor Goldberg will be talking about artificial intelligence and the uh, uncanny valley. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you to the, um, to the Sloan Foundation for, for this series. I actually love this series. And, I, and thank you for persisting in doing it. Thank you, Dan. Um, and thank you guys for coming. Uh, I have to say, I hadn't seen this film before, so um, wasn't sure exactly how kid-friendly it was going to be. But, um, <laughs> um, but I, I have to say, it's a, uh, it is a very interesting film. And it raises a lot of questions that I think are, are on everyone's mind today. And so I'd like to open it up. And I have a few perspectives I might share with you on um, where I think this film is, is coming from that, um, that I'll show you a few slides. And then we can talk about um, that we can answer questions. I'll be happy to, to sort of have it as a discussion. The one phrase that I like to use a lot is, um, is that all robots are mirrors. And it's a, it's a way of thinking about systems like artificial intelligence and and robots, which I think of together as, as very similar, uh, as really reflections of ourselves. That why we have this incredible fascination for them, and this is very persistent, is that they are something that we've always, um, that, that essentially is going to always fascinate us because it's basically us. And there is a long history, so the idea the ideas that in that you saw in this film really trace back to the ancient, the earliest forms of um, civilization, back to the Egyptians, the Greeks, uh, up through a contemporary time. And there are things like the the, the golem of Prague, which was um, a, a Jewish version of this myth, the uh, something called the Sandman, which was. In 1816, so this was a, an old Gothic novel, but it's essentially at its core, it's about a robot. It's about a, a female robot that <clears throat> a boy falls in love with. And this, um, of course, we know that uh, this, uh, this in some way very directly influenced um, Mary Shelley in her writing of, of Frankenstein, which is uh, 200 years. We're selling, celebrating the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. And I would say that this film is essentially in the very long history of Frankenstein films. And it's a, it's a beautiful new twist on it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's this very sim similar structure. Now, um, I, I, one of the things that uh, I've learned about recently is this idea that Sigmund Freud um, wrote about in 1919 called Unheimlich. And this is a, a, a what he called an emotion. It's an emotion that we all feel, but that we don't have it. We don't really have quite an, an English version for this. And Freud wrote this essay, and <clears throat> basically the best way to understand it is is we're you're familiar with déjà vu, right? Déjà vu is where you you see something strange and you say, "I feel like I was there before," right? That's from strange, but it's familiar. And Unheimlich is the opposite. That's where you feel something is familiar. Um, something that's very familiar, but suddenly becomes strange to you. And that's, this is uh, essentially at the core of many, uh, many aspects of literature, many, many examples of literature, Gothic literature, but really you can think of it as uh, anything that has to do with vampires is, uh, is, is unheimlich. Because your vampire, you know, you see it, looks like someone you know, and then, you know, it turns, the fangs come out. And uh, they're closely related to the cousins of, um, of the vampires, the, uh, the zombies. And the zombies, the same thing, right? You just, you see somebody, you're not sure it's your neighbor, but suddenly, you know, it starts eating your flesh. Um, but we are fascinated by these, uh, these, 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 uh, these sort of tales and these species and this, these stories. And another example is in the context of robots. And so Blade Runner was the idea of these replicants, right, that were constructed but not human, but you couldn't tell the difference. And interestingly, the fundamental test to determine if the replicant was real or not was the empathy test, if you remember. So this is a scene from that empathy test. And it's interesting that um, uh, Decker is trying to, 
to test to test another um, replicant to figure out right, and they go through these things where they look at the eyes very closely, um, and of course it's really nice that it comes up in this film that we just watched that empathy very early on right. They talk about well give the give the character more empathy, and they said we can't because empathy requires something we can't do with a machine. Um, and then we get to robots, and so there's a there's a long history. That's one of my um, favorite topics, but um, I don't want to dwell too far on it. But I want to uh, mention this this idea that was actually developed by a uh, an, a Japanese designer of robots. He noticed something interesting. He said that if you if you plot a, a, a sort of um, graph where you have things being not human to more human like, um, as you make them more human like, things become more likable and uh, more more comfortable, more pleasing, more interesting, uh, up to a point. And there's a point when you suddenly get something that suddenly starts to um, make you uncomfortable. And this is actually not a hu real baby, this is a doll. Okay, and there's a whole species of uh, genre of these dolls that are called, uh, that are ultra-realistic dolls. I don't know about you, but they're kind of a, they're a little bit creepy. Um, and the... Um, the, this is, this is what, what was called this phenomenon that if you make this thing too human-like, it suddenly becomes very unlikable. That you kind of cross through this very this strange non-linearity where things are likable and then they become suddenly not likable. And it, this, um, of course, if you keep going, you get to things that are likable again. Um, really, hu real humans are, are likable, but you have this weird thing going on. And so um, that thing, that valley in this curve was later um, connected to the concept of um, unheimlich. And unheimlich has been translated as uncanny. And so this is known as the uncanny valley, this phenomenon that if you make things too lifelike, you actually, the, the system will backfire. And you'll actually make people deeply uncomfortable. And this trends, this connects directly to Freud's, Freud's idea of, of, the, of this emotion that something is strange, um, or sorry, familiar, yet strange. And that dialectic, that, that tension is really, is very complex and interesting and very deeply rooted. And now it turns out that the idea of the uncanny valley, once you understand it, it means that, for example, in, when in animators think about this, so when they do animation, they make sure that the eyes of the characters are not too realistic. So um, this is very typical, right? Toy Story and others. The character may be doing interesting, may, may be quite realistic, but they never mess with the eyes. Because when they do that, the eyes can actually um, really make people uncomfortable if they make very realistic eyes. And it also relates to things like prosthetics. So sometimes if you make a prosthetic, sorry, if you're prosthetic that's too realistic, um, it will actually make people uncomfortable. Like if you try to make it too much like skin, it doesn't work, but if you make it really different, then people feel more comfortable around it. And um, yeah, you see these are examples of this, um, these, these geminoids or human-like beings that are extremely, uh, you know, essentially make you extremely uncomfortable. And <laughs> I don't know if you do as well, but um, the guy in the center here is actually uh, a robotics engineer who's been building these, but I think he's really doing this as, a, as, a, as an artist. He's really a study. He's, 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 he's very interested in engaging these emotions. And this is, um, I also want to say that this isn't, it doesn't always happen, only happen in the, um, in the realm of um, human-like things. Many of you are familiar with this big dog, and it's uh, very uncomfortable. Um, creepiness. I like what people have um, done to respond to this. There's a whole genre. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I, I think that's a great response to it. And it really, artists have played with this. So famously, Andy Warhol said, I want to be a robot. I think, by the way, Andy Warhol was, was incredibly prescient, a true genius. He predicted many things. I mean, when he said, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Remember that? That was like long before TEDx. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Andy Warhol is... Um, it, you know, was was playing with this, and I think that's very at the core of a lot of artistic works, and, um, and certainly of the film that we see, we watched just now. So it's it's playing on this idea that you 
you, he's crossing into this uncanny valley with the in the auditory realm and it works exactly the same way as it does in the visual realm so you have something that he you know was is at one level is um they're trying to make it more and more um friendly but then it crosses too far and that is really an important lesson to us about our technologies that we don't want them to be too much like us right we want to know when it's when it's real when it's not and that's it, it, I find this fascinating question. This and, and artificial intelligence seems to that today we hear about, you know, this this incredible progress that's being made, and there is progress. But I can talk about later where I I think it's it's not nearly as far as people are saying. But also that the um, there's this 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 sort of fascination, this fear and fascination that is coming that it's going to you know start taking over in some way. But really, we we want very we we want to retain some separation between us and um, and those beings. And I'll just mention very quickly the other film in this genre that came after, I believe, this film. I'm not sure exactly when, when Her came out. Was it before? This was 2016, actually, this, the, um, the film we just watched. Her was a little before that? Yeah, it was probably one of those things where the filmmakers were working on this film in parallel, and then Her came out, and they were like, oh, no. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, all right. Anyway, and I also want to mention, um, um, of course, this is come true, right? I mean, what's amazing, that was 2016. I believe that was before Alexa came out. And it was Alexis as they opened the film. So I love how, how, how uh, you know, life imitates art. Um, and we all, we all use this. How many use Alexa in their homes? I have use it? Okay. Um, the rest of you will within the next couple of years. <laughs> It's kind of amazing. All right, so um, let me let me open up for questions. Any um, any comments or questions, Adam? So you you know that we've seen this story before throughout history. This so you can you, you notice we've seen this story before. This Pygmalion myth throughout history, and then Hollywood puts it out with her in this movie. Um, but you're actually in the trenches. You're on the front lines. You're working with technologists training them, making robots, synths, AIs, all these bots, all these things. Have you ever seen an inappropriate relationship uh, between, say, one of your students or one of your colleagues and an artificial being? Ever. Or anything close, ever. Next question. No, um, um. Oh, Alice. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, there is, I, I do have a friend who actually worked on a chatbot. Yeah. And that was um, very, um, yeah, it was the first one. Well, it was different. So the, by the way, the history of a, a, something you can talk with and have a conversation with is very interesting. It goes back to Alan Turing and the, the Turing test, the definition of intelligence. And um, people have tried to build these things. There's a famous one called Loliza came out in the 60s, 70s. And it was really interesting because it was, um, or 60s actually, it was an early example of artificial intelligence where um, the, the, the scientist, computer scientist, Weizenbaum, who created it, meant it essentially to show how, 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 um, how easy it was to fool people into um, believing something was real. And it was a very simple program. Literally, it's, it's like a couple pages of code. My daughter built something like it very sim in her in her class in high school, but what was interesting was it was um, it was picked up and people started saying this is the future of psychology, and that this is what we're gonna this, that we're not gonna have any more psychologists any at, at, and then you can look at these old headlines and it horrified Weizenbaum. He was really, you know, he felt how could this be misinterpreted? He was trying to say just the opposite that there are incredible limitations. These things are very simple, but. Um, that idea of um, that early chatbot still reappears. And my friend's insight was that when the internet came out, that he could tap into the power of the internet and use it to collect lots and lots of data, which is actually related to this film as well, and then use that data to have the system essentially get better and better over time. So he would have it, he would basically look at the traces, and uh, what was also going on was that he, had, um, he was bipolar. So he was having a kind of a nervous breakdown as he was building this incredible system. So it's a, and 
so I think because so it's not so far fetched. I think this phenomenon, what you might have here, where you get so engrossed in the um, in the system. Um, I don't do that personally because the robots I, I work with are pretty uh, not pretty clearly not human. Um, I'm uh, I'm not a big fan of humanoids. I think that I'm more of an engineer and I like to build things that that really work reliably. And um, so, for example, I've spent a lot of, most of my life trying to build a robot that can just pick up things uh, out of a box, <laughs> and it's incredibly boring. <laughs> and uh, I've worked for 35 years on this, and, and we've made like very little progress. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's an interesting, but we, are, we actually are, it's now being um, applied to things like um, warehouses, where you have to fill orders rapidly, and there's a big demand for it. So we're actually making some, some, um, some baby steps toward that. But I also want to say that it's very important to reassure the workers of the world and all of us humans out there that the, the, these robots are not um, anywhere close to the complexity of human skills. That I will even go as far as to say that the, 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 the idea of self-driving cars that everybody's sure is going to happen like any day now is not going to happen anytime soon. It's really hard to do what humans do very easily. And driving like down Third Street here um, complicated. And uh, so, anyway, I'm happy to answer other questions. That, that, okay, Adam. Yes. Great question, thank you. <laughs> I, 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 what is your name, sir? Doug. Doug. Okay, thank you, Doug. Because uh, that's something I've been thinking about quite a bit. And actually, um, the the term I use is uh, because of a lot of the the headlines and the the press lately. I, I call it singularity sensationalism. And it's about this idea that um, the singularity, by the way, is this hypothetical point in time when computers will become sufficiently intelligent that they will uh, start. Uh, surpass humans and then start essentially bootstrapping themselves and getting smarter and smarter and the humans will quickly be left in the dust. And there's some people out there who say that we're getting close. This is almost, we're around the corner and this could be the existential threat, right? Because then they won't need us, we'll just be pests to them and uh, they'll, they'll destroy us. So this is exactly in the spirit of the, the, the Frankenstein stories. Um, but and so we are fascinated by it for the same reasons. It's that's we, you know, robots are mirrors, and this is another mirror. And I think it's saying something about us. So as an as a researcher, I would tell you that I don't think we're anywhere close to the to achieving singularity. We're actually able to do something um, in certain narrow domains, and that is like playing chess or go. And those those results are really interesting that we can surpass human abilities in that. But remember also, we can surpass humans in a lot of other things too. We can take the square roots of giant numbers and do all kinds of things with computers that humans can't even dream of doing. But the, the things that we humans can do are incredibly subtle and uh, in, in, in ability, for example, to have a conversation or to read body language or to understand nuances um, or to be able to just pick up um, some objects out of a box. And those things turn out to be far more intricate and complex. And, and even though we've made advances, and so driving is another example, we've made advances so we can actually drive pretty well, stay in a lane on a freeway. But driving downtown San Francisco or even San Rafael, especially if it starts to rain, um, is, is just infinitely more complicated. So I don't think we're gonna see a singularity. In, um, in, any, in, in, in any of our lifetimes, and I don't even think in our kids' lifetimes. It's, um, it's something we've talked about for a long time. There's been a lot of reports that it's around the corner, and, it, it, and we're not really much closer than we were 50 years ago. Now, most of my colleagues will agree with that, um, but there's a few people out there who 
believe you know that we're we're, we're close. Yeah. So I want to reassure you. So I do have an alternative. What I call to the uh, to the singularity uh, concept that I call multiplicity. And multiplicity is not is is really very different than this idea of a, a monolithic computer that will brain that will surpass humans. But multiplicity is about the idea of people and machines working together to become smarter collectively. So it's, you might think of it as, instead of artificial intelligence, it's intelligence amplification. And that's not a new idea. It's been around, but I'm thinking about multiplicity as a way of thinking about groups of humans and groups of machines working together. And I believe that, that is, that's not science fiction. By the way, that's exactly how Google's search system works. Google search relies on our input of data and many of these systems that we use every day to recommend books and movies and products all are essentially using our own data to, to learn collectively to reflect that back on for us. So those things, I think multiplicity is very positive. It's, it needs us. It's never going to be, it's never going to over, um, take us, um, overwhelm us, but it will up, it make us better at what we do and collectively better at working in groups. So that's my, that's my uh, response to singularity, multiplicity. Other questions? Yes. China has recently got uh, a voice, um, I'm thinking like sort of sim similar to Siri, it's very nice, but the, the Chinese regard it as almost as being real, in fact they do regard it as being real, and they'll ask it all kinds of personal questions and things that you would ask a person, you would not ask a machine. So I think the Chinese, maybe they have a different feeling about it than we do, um, but I think for them, it seems to be very real. Would you comment on that? A absolutely. Thank you. W what's your name, sir? Uh, Robert Harrison, and I'm reviewing this movie. Uh, Robert Harrison. I think it's wonderful. I think it's a great time. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So I would like to know, you probably don't know, but is there such a, a club for that, where they do 30 short scripts in 60 the, Oh, the improv. <laughs> I don't know where that, that but I love it. I, think, I agree, I agree. I want to go to there too. Um, no, thank you, Robert. Um, the, that, um, the, so he's talking about something that's called Shaolan, I believe, and it's in China. Yeah, and it's, um, what? Shao Ice. Ice. Thank you. Okay. Shao Ice. And it's, a, um, it's been very popular and, again, been picked up in the press. Been, there are stories about it. And um, it's, uh, it's a company, it basically is an app, and you can talk to it. Now, here's the story that, um, they they um, they they are um, they they keep track of how long these interactions go, how many back and forth interactions go, right? And sometimes they go on for a very long time. But there's also a report that I read where it says that when does this happen? It happens late at night, and it's usually when um, the, the the it's a lot of times it's kids, young adults, young or, or or teenagers, and they're feeling lonely, and they're sitting on a train or something, and so they're kind of going back and sort of having this communication. Um, I don't. I think they're very aware that it's not a real person. They're not fooled by it. Essentially, they know what it is, but the they're well. The article. See, that's what you have to be careful. So what I'm I'm here to say is take this take take the uh, what you read with a big, with a big grain of salt. Um, uh, even the New York Times and the New Yorker. I have to say, I've been a little uh, um, skeptical about them lately. Some of their writings. Sorry, Adam. No. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. I think that um, shall, it, it says something interesting again about this mirror because it says something interesting about these these kids who are, are spending time that they're intensely lonely, and at this hour of the night they can't. There's no one else awake. So that's what they do, is they turn to this as a way of sort of um, comforting or entertaining themselves. And that's what seems to be going on. Um, of course, we, you know, it's, it, it, the, the, the same friend who developed this um, system, this chatbot, said, you know, the Turing test, because they still have a Turing test every year, it's a competition. And he said, what happens is, um, it's not so much that the computers win, but that the humans fail. So humans can believe in things and we can project onto them. And it's this anthropomorphizing that we do all the time. So we, you know, we look at a piece of toast and we see a face. You know, we, we do that. That's very deeply rooted in us. So we want to project and we want to believe in these things. So that's not too surprising. Um, 
and so you know with this Chinese one I think it um, and there's companies now with very big motives for building systems like this right they want to keep you um, attached to your screen and I'm pretty sure they're showing ads um, on these things or at least she sneaks in a few recommendations to some at some point so um, so so I think that's true I think that um, where you, you know there's we're never at a point where you can really fool fool anyone for very long that this thing is real right we I, I would be I will I will put a bet on that that we're not going to see that anytime soon in, in the next 10 20 even 50 years Tiffany um, well I've been using this AI assistant which is oh, yeah. okay called Clara um, I have an AI assistant over email named Clara and she does have human assists but I definitely she's amazing most people don't know she's not real and um, I, I thank her at the end of every week because she does such a good job. <laughs> and people always compliment me on what an amazing assistant that I have, but she's not human. But Ken always likes to remind me that there are a lot of human assists. Yes. Because they, it, it did kind of sell itself as, as an AI assistant, but. Yeah. Um, so how many of you know about this, Clara? Or there's a, there's a number of these. <laughs> <laughs> there are these. Uh, this is a big thing now, and there's several companies that offer this as a as a um, as an AI assistant. And what happens is you, you you register and then you email this AI assistant, and it seems to do like remarkable things. Well, the secret behind it is there's humans behind them behind the curtain. Well, only on a complicated yeah. schedule. well, actually, they call it the guy proudly. I saw a talk where he proudly said, "We we have this artificial artificial intelligence." <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, exactly, and, and, and so because the, the people want this AI, but we can't actually achieve it technologically, so we can fake it by having people pretending to be AI. Um, so, so, and it works, right? These, uh, it's kind of fun, and you, can, you don't feel bad or guilty by you know, asking this thing to do work in the middle of the night, because it's just a machine, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's a great example, yes. Yes, the Uncanny Valley. Yeah, exactly. And is there any, um, any thought to a backlash that people have towards you know, what we've been told? Or, or, or is, do you feel that there's a backlash to you know, robotics are on the way, this is the way we're going to have to live, but people are getting annoyed and frustrated and it might be attributed to a certain age group, more like an older generation versus versus not, but that um, it sort of fuels behavior that's negative and not moving forward with this. Is that, is this am I? No, you're right. I think it's a great point. Um, what's your name? Donna. Donna. Thank you, Donna. I mean, it's really, I think, part of this bigger issue about how we're getting so addicted to our technologies. And Tiffany's been writing about this, and it's very interesting. I think that we're we're getting, um, you know, the, 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 we have major corporations with major resources developing these systems that are designed to capture and hold our attention. So games and likes and little nuances like like Twitter, which uh, Tiffany just pointed out. My wife, Tiffany, by the way, um, pointed out that um, when you we get likes for something, it turns out that the system doles out the likes. It doesn't give them all at once. It gives them to you over time because it keeps you hooked and checking your system, which is you know diabolically brilliant, right? Of course they do that. Um, so absolutely, I think it's raising concerns. It's having a huge effect on um, kids. And so um, there's been a big movement in schools now to really try and address what's going on with um, students and attention spans and being essentially addicted to this. Um, I can't turn it off. So it's a very big issue. Of course, the, the, and, and um, I'll just, I'm not gonna, should I mention your approach to this? No. All right, well, Tiffany's working on something that's a way of addressing this way by essentially taking a break one day a week. Um, and, Let's be certain. Let's 
Not yeah. No, I, th I think you're right, Donna. The, you know, example we're just seeing today, you know, the, this, uh, the recent elections just this week, um, that there's a huge wave of resentment and anger out there. And a lot of it's directed toward the Bay Area. <laughs> um, partly because, you know, it's, it's, the people do feel left behind and there's a big gulf between uh, people who are technologically, you know, using all these tools and very comfortable with them or those who are feeling like they don't. They don't really get the benefits. And <clears throat> so I think that's, that's definitely there's, um, this is something important and we need to pay attention to it. Very much so. I mean, I think it's an international phenomenon, and it's not just a little blip. This is something that's here and it's going on, and it does have to do with technology. I mean, I think you even, I would say, is it's it, even in the Middle East when we look at um, these uh, these fundamentalist groups, it's similar because they're also feeling this intense anger and frustration about um, this sort of progress that they're not getting to, or or they don't even want, but it seems to be moving a, 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 a ahead of them. So, um, and then another thing I'll mention just really quickly in the same regard is um, the whole issues of privacy around this. You know, that we are opening up this Pandora's box with this thing. And we, you know, the, the idea of cameras, right, we're putting them all over the place. We have the microphones. You know, what's interesting about um, um, the, uh, the Alexa is that we, we actually, um, you know, now we buy that and we put it right, right by our bed. So it's an alarm clock. We just put a speaker connected to the internet by our bedroom, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> amazing what, what, what corporations could get us to do. Uh, so yeah, I think we need to be worried about that. I think that you know, what we're seeing now with Facebook and others are, are sort of the tip of the iceberg of what we're gonna see about um, what privacy can be, it can be eroded. Yes? I, I, I have to admit, I, um, thank you, that's a good question, and what's your name? Janet. Janet. Um, I do think that, I, I, when it first came out, the idea that, you know, we should sign this thing, I was a little skeptical. Um, you know, these, these, um, these sort of um, co statements, declarations, that there were petitions, and I'm coming around to actually thinking there is something to that. I think, um, you know, just as there has been in, in nuclear, um, or against um, certain forms of experimentation with genetics, right? That it actually makes sense that we should draw the line. And there was a case where recently with Google and um, and the Defense Department, did people see that? Um, Google had um, just started doing some research for the Department of Defense, and they were using some of their AI tools. And the actually, to their credit, the Google employees um, really raised this issue and created a huge controversy and then Google decided to stop doing that. And so they have their own statement of ethics. And I do think that's a that's a healthy thing. It's gonna be complex to 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 get that, but but maybe I think that would be would be valuable in the future. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, um, so to get, so one of the things that's happened is, um, so one of the things that people sometimes say is that technology is exponential. And, and, and they show, you know, it's a, it sounds like a scientific word, it's exponential, but if people who use that show that they don't understand what they're talking about. Because exponential is, is something that doubles, you know, um, in, in a sort of, in a very, very um, quickly growing way. Now there's Moore's Law, and I'm very aware of that, but that's kind of an extremely unusual case. Um, and most people agree that we're reaching the end of that as well. Um, but the, the, um, what's happened, there was a, what happens usually in, in science progress is that it's punctuated equilibrium. So things move along and then there's a jump. Some, some basic insight happens like theory of relativity or something. And then, you know, that suddenly changes everything and then there's a lot of progress around it and then there's another jump somewhere else. So what's happened in the last five years is this particular jump that's um, known as deep learning. And it was, and there's no doubt this is a real thing, it's fascinating because it's basically um, a combination of three things. It's lots of data, lots of computing, and a new class of algorithms that puts those two things together and uses the the data to train these large networks. 
of, um, of weights. And some people say it's like the way the brain works. It's not really, we don't understand the brain. Um, so it's not like that. But it's, it is powerful. And, it, and, and now because we do have access to lots of data because of all these tools and um, networks out there, that we're able to um, collect such data and then train these systems. And that's how we're getting these systems that are capable of, of doing voice recognition much better than they were in the past. Or image, right? Google search and things where you give it an image and it, or give it a word and it finds images. That's being used by this new class of deep learning methods. So that's a big, that's a new thing. And, um, but I also starting to see its limitations as well. So that was a jump. And so we're starting, that's tapering off, I think. And what we w will probably be interesting is that um, as we start putting that together with networks, computer networks, um, we can actually start having systems that, that get better over time and learn over long periods of time. And that, I think, is an area that's going to start to be a, possibly another jump. But it's not like any of these jumps are suddenly going to leap us into the realm of human equivalence. That, I think, we're very far away from. Now, I will, I will be the first to admit that I'm, anyone who claims that this will never happen right, is really you know, probably going to be wrong. So I may be wrong. I'm not... I'm not saying this adamantly, but I'm saying that all the evidence that I have from when I talk to people and the people who are doing research in these areas, really doing down in the trenches, they all agree that it's being over, overstated. So um, we're making progress, and I want, hope we get you know, to continue making progress on, on these things and making all these systems better in some way, but I don't think we're at the point when they're going to be better than us. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Full. It sounds like funny. I mean, are you full of it? Um, no, I, uh, I, I. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I am. Um, I, I, I'm. I'm skeptical in the sense of. Um, I think we're there's more surprises in store for us, and negative surprises. I think we're we're not done with those. Um, but I also am hopeful. I, I am. I think. Uh, I am, and, and this comes back to what. My, what, what I've found, is, again, about this idea of mirrors, that every time, everything I've done about studying robotics is, has led me to a greater and greater appreciation for humans, our abilities, and, and our brains. It is so complex and, and, and intricate. And so um, what gives me a lot of hope is the way education has been changing. And I, I have to say the students that I see are getting smarter, and, and very distinctly smarter over the last 20 years. Then, and I think it's, it's due to the internet and the tools, the technologies that are out there, to help them learn better. And so they're able, you know, you think about it, because they, they from, let's say, middle school, they're, they're accessing the internet, they're learning all kinds of things, they're getting videos of information that they don't, they missed at class and they can follow up. And so they end up getting just better. And this, we see the result of that when they're applying to, to college and grad schools. They're very, very smart. We're all kind of scratching our heads and like, wow, this, these kids are publishing papers. It's very common that, that, that students applying to grad school will have not just one or two or three published papers. Yeah, so and that didn't happen 20 years ago. So that's why I'm hopeful. Because I think that as these tools, with all their limitations and dangers and challenges, are also in, at the same time opening us up and connecting us and giving us access to our own results and ideas. And that, I think, is going to hopefully, there's those minds out there 
some of them who may be in this room, who are going to make those discoveries and those ideas that are really going to help us in the future. Thank you.